Hiya, Gullam. How is life with you? Life is awesome. Thank you very much, Lee. Keeping myself immensely busy uh, making candles. Making? Oh, come on. Tell me about making candles. Well, first of all, I'm quite proud of myself for learning to make candles. And I was talking to colleagues at work about what have you done recently? Uh, and someone else led off by saying, well, I've actually rebuilt an entire cottage uh, from the stonework up over the last year. Why? What have you done? <laughs> uh, let's carry on talking about the cottage. I can't really compete with that. No, yeah, candles are, they're, they're very, it's very relaxing. You just stick them in the, uh, you stick your, can, your little jar, I got, oh, you can't see, but you can see, look, it's one of them. So it's yeah, like yeah. a glass full of wax. Stick it in a pan on the low boil and it all melts and then you just put a new wick in it. It's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Well, there's a lot of candles knocking around the house now because it's, just getting, it's getting a bit obsessive. Well, what have you been doing? Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. What have I been doing? <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll, stick, I'll stick with the candle thing first because I've been walking as much as I can with earphones in listening to podcasts and i've really got into the um oh god i've forgotten what it's called <laughs> is it a podcast it is a podcast <laughs> is it two ips in a pod no it's not two ips in a oh, pod, although i do listen to this occasionally i'm gonna to have to look up on my phone this is how embarrassing this, is this this is Fra- this Fran, is, Fran, you've got to no, this is keep this keep this this is this is what people so, tune in so for i've only been listening to it for like about three months um, so it's no, no such thing as a fish, which is the um, podcast by the QI Elves. And l- last night's one, when I was walking around the golf course, is um, touched on candles. But it touched on candles in the military sense. And do you know, do you know that um, the military make their candles out of uh, animal fat, tallow? Right. And they do it so that they're not just candles, but they're also edible. So there's a, there's a candle market for you, mate. Oh, well, funnily enough, the wax I'm getting is made out of soy. So oh. I've got like that'd be really good for vegan soldiers. So, yeah, exactly right. So you've got two markets. You've got Jeez. the oh no, the power's gone down. We need to light the house market, mm-hmm. and oh no, we're out on this kind of walk across the moors, and we've run out of provisions. I'll eat the candle. One of the candle fact. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. this might just be wrong. Let's not call it a fact. Let's call it something I think might be true, which <laughs> is that I think the law still says that on a bicycle, if you're going to light it actually leds are illegal and you either have to have a glowing filament or you can have a candle i'm, I'm gonna have to go and look that up after this podcast and try it just I've try got, it i've got leds on the bicycle that never leaves my garage stick a candle on it so anyway stick a can, and it might encourage me to take out doesn't the um doesn't it get on your wick oh! <laughs> we probably better get on with the show i think mate yeah So let me introduce you to Rebecca O'Kelly-Gillard. Rebecca is uh, a partner at Bird and Bird, and she's come on the pod today to talk to us about all things social media and IP. So, um, Rebecca, big, big welcome. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, both. And thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Big fan of the the podcast. It's brilliant. Oh, you're a fan. Excellent. (laughs) There you go. That's me. Um, Are you the one who's listened 10,000 times? That's awesome. (laughs) Well, I'm I'm a fan. I'm not that fan. (laughs) I'm not going to clobber your ankles anytime soon. Hi, I'm Rebecca Kelly-Gillard. I am a partner in Bird and Bird in our IP team. And I deal mainly with contentious stuff, but also advisory. And my kind of growing area of expertise is anything with an online focus on digital and so social media social media platforms and people who engage with them like influencers so all the IP around that so hopefully I'll be able to answer a question or two for you today and we've got a fair few lined up because I've actually bothered to do some research for a change so um, <laughs> and, I, and I am I am quite keen on social media people who know me know that I'm sort of batter around on Twitter a bit doing stuff so oh, until, uh, they, until they banned you yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> i always come back though <laughs> and I, actually let me tell you a little story rebecca because um there's a there's a bit of background to why we wanted to do a social media podcast now when we when we first thought of the idea of doing a podcast we were struggling over a name and someone came up with it might have even been me but someone came up with idea soup because it kind of like was a play on we're going to be talking mm-hmm. about ideas and it's a bit of a kind of melting pot and all that sort of I thing. I like it. Good stuff. Yeah, except we did a little bit of due diligence and we did find that there was a guy uh, doing a bit of social stuff on TikTok and um, and his name on TikTok was Idea Soup. So we thought, ah, we'll reach out to him and just explain what we're doing and explain that it's entirely mm-hmm. different. And um, 
and then having a conversation with him, it sort of transpired that he was keen to kind of get into other media and to start to do a podcast in the future and that he would quite like to hang on to the name. And we felt as sort of like big bad SEPA, guardians of all things intellectual property in the UK, <laughs> that it wouldn't really be good for us to go trampling mm. over his potential IP. So we started thinking about another name and we came up with two IPs in a pod, which in any case is a far, far better name. Far superior. So quick question about who owns their identity in social media, because I'm guessing that because he was only active on TikTok, we could have possibly gone with the idea soup thing and built a brand around mm -hmm. it and so on. So how, how does it work? Who, who owns a social media identity? Well, I think that's interesting because one of the things that I, I was thinking about after we had our, our prep chat the other day was, you know, another of these myths and the myth IP still exists just because you're on social media doesn't mean all IP rights go out the window. So kudos to the pair of you for doing that due diligence. If someone, even if they only operate on social media, they will still have built up rights in their name. Now, there might be an argument as to where those rights exist. So if he's a guy on TikTok and he only has US followers because he's got like a super US focused niche, like, you know, baseball or something like that, then the likelihood of him having a huge following in the UK where you might be focusing your podcast, for example, there might be no overlap. And so from an IP perspective, it's fine. But I totally agree with you as the uh, vanguards of upholding IP rights, you don't necessarily want to just even get into that kind of fight. But the other thing is that, you know, if they do have a reputation, then what's that reputation in and what might it flow into? And could your two worlds overlap? And the likelihood is if they're very active on social media, then they might be able to sculpt a reputation in relation to podcasting or social media or yeah. or advertising their wares over the internet or something like that and then you could clash so definitely a good idea to uh to do some some due diligence so we've got a fairly ip savvy audience listening in and and their parents apparently as well lee by the way <laughs> um i was hearing from work which is nice so hi parents what ip right are we actually talking about? is it basically passing off that is where you'd eventually sit or well, I guess for, for the image rights, it's probably along the lines of passing. It could be trademark, you know, infringement. I, I doubt there are too many uh, social media people that, you know, that have registered any trademarks to date. So, yes, it would probably be passing off. But then depending on what the, um, you know, the infringement is, it could, it, the other one that's most likely to occur is copyright. So when we're talking about people posting things on social media and then other people using it, we're getting into the world of copyright. But if you're talking about image rights, Absolutely. There are no, technically, there are no image rights in the UK. And so it would be passing off, associating or aff affiliating yourself without authorization with that entity or passing yourself also off as being connected to them. Okay, I'm going to continue trampling over these carefully prepared set of questions. You go, you go for it, mate. It's nice to hear you speak for a change. <laughs> Out of interest, I mean, we've got a long history of the law trying to keep up with technological and yeah. social changes, and IP is a really good example of that. Um, the, the, the world of patents is all about the 1978 view of what software is, basically. Yeah. You know, is that what we're going to see? Just people just trying to fiddle, pass in off, and try mark law and copyright law to try and cope with a completely new series of, of events or a little bit change? yeah okay. i think so i think so you know there have been you know in the eu last year there's the um digital single market copyright directive but it doesn't really substantially change any of the actual black letter law about what copyright is or what tra a trademark is or it's really more about what might be an infringement and what platforms need to do and things like that but yes you're still trying to uh, shoehorn the traditional types of IP into social media usage. Absolutely. Uh, and what if, hypothetically speaking, somebody, <laughs> hypothetically speaking, yeah. had by mistake a fake online identity yeah. that they created because they can't manipulate Facebook and named themselves online after a band they created for middle-aged people? <laughs> hypothetically so, speaking. This, this is, of course, entirely hypothetical, isn't hypothetical. it? Hypothetical. Yeah. Um, no, actually, the background being that I'm um, <laughs> not relevant or anything. Online uh, on Facebook, this I'm... is just me giving you advice now, Gwilym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did. We did say when we slip into when we slip into proper stuff, we'll just do the normal early rate. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> no, it's actually just uh, just a side story. Um, have I told you this league? Because a while ago, 
we created a band at home for all my kind of lots of parents at the local schools to do a battle of the bands trying to find a new name for a band not the topic of this podcast is actually quite difficult we had hip replacement i thought that was you know you've got the music thing in the middle of it um but in the end i couldn't find anything that hadn't been done so i did I, I decided that nobody had ever called themselves the barry triffid quintet which seems to be true from google searching and everything else so I created a Facebook page, but accidentally changed my Facebook name. So I'm now Barry Triffid <laughs> on Facebook. And you know, when you book things and order things, it says, do you want to log in through Facebook? That's what <laughs> I do. As a result of which my Uber identity is Barry Triffid. And now <laughs> when I get in an Uber, I have to say, hi, I'm Barry. Um, so that's not relevant to the podcast, but it's just, just goes to show just how far off the law is with dealing with that complex fact matrix. Yeah, although, you know, I'm sure the Elton Johns and the David Bowies of the world managed to navigate it. So hopefully, Barry, one day you'll be you'll be equally on par with them. Oh, first hit on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprisingly. Anyway, so I, I digress. Lee, back to you. Cheers, mate. The, um, <laughs> it, was, it was very kind of you to congratulate us on our due diligence. But to be fair, we never actually found um, Idea Superman. It was my daughter. Uh, the, the way it went was we did a big, long search. We couldn't find anybody at all. Mm -hmm. And I was just went home and I was so excited. I was explaining to my wife, Anne, and the two girls what we were up to. And I did a suit. And my youngest daughter said, I'll follow him on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah! Right. Well, well done to your daughter then. This is just going to be a load of anecdotes, isn't it? Um, let's think a little bit about brand identity because Gwilym sort of touched on it there, didn't he? He's developing a brand, um, personal brand in that case. <laughs> so we've seen, you see quite a lot on social media, don't you, in terms of brands trying to develop an online uh -huh, personality. Uh -huh. Can you talk to us a little bit about that relationship between um, protecting a brand in old world through yeah. IP rights and protecting a brand through social media? Well, it's funny you say that because I... Um... I wouldn't say banging on to brands the whole time, but one of my big missions is to make brands realize that their legal department and their marketing department kind of almost now need to be just totally in tandem every step of the way because the legal department is thinking of trademarks and what have we registered and where have we registered and what are our products and where are we selling them and what classes of goods have we got our trademarks covered for? Whereas the marketing team are... How are we marketing our brand? What's the funkiest, coolest thing that we can do or the thing that's most aligned with our brand identity? And what is the social media market for that? Whether it's Instagram, whether it's TikTok, whatever, you know, Snapchat, whatever it is. And they're not talking to each other. So, you know, part of what you need to do is, is meld these two or, or, you know, facilitate conversations between these two groups so that people can plan in a much more meaningful way. Because there's no point launching a product with this fabulous name. And I know that, you know, the business gets incredibly entrenched in a name as soon as they come up with it, such as, you know, Barry Triffitt or whatever it might be. But, you know, and so they really are so loath to let it go that they really want to like cling on to it. But then they try and go and launch something on Snapchat and there's someone on it, like Idea Superman, you know. So you're just shooting yourself in the foot if you're not thinking from day one about your social media presence. So I call it your digital footprint. You know, what is your, your off world footprint, not your carbon one, but your, you know, what is your brand identity or what are your products and how is that reflected in your digital footprint and do the two match up. And the other thing you need to do is think defensively. So, okay, fine. You might never want to be on TikTok because it's not married to your brand, you know, ethos or identity because you're going for an audience that isn't you know necessarily tiktok's primary audience Me. that does well um but you know that doesn't mean that someone if you have a really big hit that someone isn't going to try and register that name on tiktok and then you know hold you to ransom so you also need to be thinking defensively so you need to be thinking what are our, how do we actually want to promote ourselves but also generally what are the most social media platforms and do we need to put anything in place on them just to prevent other people from using them as well but that does sound i mean we've been here before with trademarks uh, and cyber squatting and all these things yeah. and so we're yeah. we're back again in a sense with it does seem and, and this sounds awful in relation to this kind of lovely free online world that we've developed but it does sound like there might be a risk that the regulation required 
from the lessons we've learned from the trade model or over the last hundred years? Yeah, maybe, maybe. But then I think I, I think the issue is more in relation to what are the resources available to take action if someone is infringing online? Because trademark litigation is just so disproportionate from a cost perspective. So really, I think the focus isn't, do we need to regulate the kind of the activities online in relation to IP usage? It's more, how can we, if there's really, you know, obnoxious infringement going on and not just a mistake or people not being aware of someone else but if it's you know really deliberate then you know how can platforms be engaged in that process to have it taken down more quickly and, and you know that's part of the the copyright directive that came out you know what is the two-way conversation that's going on between rights holders and between the platforms to make that process easier but you know at the same time in in, in fairness to platforms there's a line to be tread because anyone can assert IP infringement. It doesn't mean it's necessarily infringement. And you can't have some companies bullying little players out and kind of overstretching what their IP rights actually are just to kind of, you know, get a name back that they never thought to register themselves. So it is a really fine and difficult line to tread. That sounds very depressing. Sorry for a nice uplifting podcast. (laughs) It's, it's quite fascinating, isn't it? Because um, the whole domain name squatting thing, as Gwilym yeah. said, was was big business. Has, to your knowledge, has there been an element of that in social? Not to the same extent yet, I don't think, no. I, and I, I really I think domains is still a really, really big issue because there's been a thing called, they were called new GTLDs. So most people think of .com, not .info. Yeah. But in the last few years, there's now dot pet or dot book and so there's just all these other domain names available that never existed before and the other thing that's happening so so you've kind of more things that you need to monitor then the other thing is happening is that people don't necessarily set up a website but they could still be using a domain name for an email for fraudulent purposes and that's a big thing especially now for example in the pandemic people just setting up domain names and then emailing pretending to be fraud I mean I saw one and it was someone pretending to send a letter from the WHO in relation to the pandemic and asking for credit card details. I mean, wow. it's shocking the things that are going on. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's kind of follow that one up a little bit because the the other thing that we've seen big expansion of in social media is parody. Yeah. So can we can we talk a little bit about parody because it fasc- it fascinates me that people some people get it right, don't they? So you get the the person who kind of created Her Majesty the Queen on Twitter and is very funny and yeah like and then some people get it horribly wrong because they set it up maybe with um, malicious intent or at least maybe trying to get back at a brand because they feel slighted by it and it all goes yeah. all goes horribly wrong because it gets a bit kind of aggressive but where do parodies fit in in all of this again you know parodies are permitted because in the copyright act there's there's an exemption for for parody and and that's great so but you know parody is you need to know recognize what the original is and you need to realize that this is a kind of spin or a skit on that original and, and they're the requirements um but all for it and and that's kind of another example of where a brand might be a bit too heavy-handed and they might come in and say look you know parodies are accepted you gotta you gotta take some things on the chin or at least tailor how you're dealing with things i mean there were some great examples over the last few years about um hbo trying to stop uh game of thrones events in pubs and they sent cease and desist letters in the <laughs> language of game of thrones you know and, and that kind of thing and and so it's like appreciating the fans that are out there and appreciating that they are trying to promote you know and, and have fun and and like fan fiction type thing and, and and parody it but at the same time say you're kind of crossing over the line so can you stop now um it was all fun and games but but please d- desist um but in a friendly way but um technically parodies are permitted it's just is it really a parody or as you say is it just a guise for something else and and if it is, then is it reputation damage, you know, trademark yeah, damage, yeah. 10, 10 3 type thing, you know? I've just very quickly, if you've heard any tapping at the keyboards, I've just quickly registered myself on Facebook as the, the Barry Triffid quintu- quintuplets. So um... <laughs> <laughs> that's not a problem. I have a very good lawyer, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Where should we go next? And let's talk a little bit about content, shall we? We've talked a bit about sure. identity, so let's talk a little bit about content. Do I own everything I create in social spaces? Is it mine? 
Yeah, and I think this is the thing. I think people think, like I said at the beginning, people think that as soon as you go on social media, all IP goes out the window. It doesn't. You still own it. You know, copyright exists as soon as you create it. Just because you're creating it on social media doesn't mean you don't own it. But, and there's always a but when it comes to social media, it's always kind of like, yes, but. Um, but you've given large rights to other people so you've basically carved you still own it and you can still enforce it but generally and I, I say this is kind of the general rule of thumb every platform's terms and conditions differ so you know you do need to read the fine print and all that but as a general rule of thumb the way it works is if you put something on social media it, on a platform so let's say Instagram for the sake of using an yeah. a platform if you put something on, on Instagram, then you have granted very broad rights to well, Facebook now or, or it, other Instagram users to use anything that you've put up on Instagram within Instagram itself. So they can copy it, they can um, like it, they can you know share it with others. But, so let, let, let me just test that I understood okay. that. So you've also given those rights to other users of that platform? Yeah. You've given it to, to the the platform and then anyone who uses the platform yeah, okay. to use it, generally speaking. But with, within that platform? To or? use it within the platform, exactly. So then as soon as you go off platform and let's say you're on TikTok, so a company totally unaffiliated with um, Instagram or its owner, and you're on TikTok. And so you just transplant something that you found brilliant on Instagram and you put it on TikTok that is most likely going to be an infringement of their IP because you're no longer in the Instagram world. You're now in the TikTok world and they haven't given you rights to use it outside okay. of Instagram. Got it. So that's a general rule of thumb. There might be differences, but that's the general rule of thumb. So if I'm the owner of the person who put up the original post and I was perfectly happy for everyone to use it on Instagram, but then I see it on TikTok, I could write to that person and say, or, you know, most likely send a takedown on TikTok saying, stop sharing this, it's mine. And this is, you know, one of the, and I know we discussed this the other day, this is one of the most common myths that I see is like, just because it's on social media does not mean it's free for you to use. Social media means it's most likely free to, for you to use it within that piece of social media, but not elsewhere. And again, that's where brands might trip up. They might um, engage with a fan on one social media and then use that on another piece. And the fan might be totally fine with that because they, you know, they're, touched and honoured that the brand that they love is engaging with them but they might not be um, so you do need to be careful and, and I would say a, a word of warning in particular is in relation to photographers and that's not in any way disparaging about photographers it's just that it's so hard for them to make a living it's so hard for them to make money that they are very very protective of their rights so they are prob so in particular photographs and you know famous photographs just because there's like a paparazzi picture of someone does not mean you can go away and start using that paparazzi picture wherever you want photographers will most likely come after you and um and seek compensation for that and it's not just you know the paparazzi style photographers it's anyone it could be a wildlife photo it's very hard for people to make a living in the creative arts and so they often pursue you for it and these these rights are the, the, the freedom to share within the same platform but potentially not outside that platform that's presumably effectively a shrink wrap license when you sign up to your exactly. platform you're just, you're signing up to those terms yeah I, I always find it's useful to understand the commercial intent behind that is that basically because each platform is very keen to have an internal culture of sharing and retweeting or whatever whatever yeah, relevant for that platform i think so i think part of it is potentially covering their own ass just making sure that whatever they want to do with it you know so if they want to put up advertising in relation to it and stuff that they can because often it will be t the terms and conditions are we can use it for whatever we want whether it's in the platform or not but also exactly that it's to create this community and to keep that community within that platform because if the same content is available on every single platform then what's unique about theirs so it's it's kind of keeping that little world in one place and keeping all the eyes on that one world and um, what about if i change my mind so i've signed i've signed up to instagram i haven't actually it's far too young and trendy for me but i've, I've signed up for instagram mm -hmm. except that i've licensed away rights in a particular way i decide instagram's not for me but i put out quite a bit of content mm -hmm. and i leave can i revoke that and say no nope, all the stuff i've created isn't yours anymore generally again broadly speaking the terms and conditions are 
perpetual and irrevocable. So what you can do is you can remove your profile and you can, you know, delete everything that you have ever posted. So that won't be available for people to find from you again. But to the extent that it's already been shared and it's already been circulated, then that circulated copy, you can't retrieve that, generally speaking. The echoes. Exactly. Oh, that's great. Yeah, echoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Echoes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I always really get annoyed if someone steals one of my jokes on Twitter because my jokes are amazing, as Gwilym will testify. Nobody has ever stolen one of your <laughs> jokes on Twitter. Why would they do that? <laughs> It's happened to me, honest. Um, <laughs> but the, the example that works for me, and as I've bothered to do the research, I'll bring it into the into yeah. the chat, is the, the popular music entertainer, Frank Ocean. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything about him at all, really. But he, he wore a T-shirt at the um, at New York's Panorama Festival in 2017 mm-hmm. that had written on it, why be racist, sexist, homophobic, or transphobic, when you could just be quiet. And it went absolutely mad. The maker of the shirt was a very small company, Green Box mm-hmm. Shop, who was who was making that shirt and that he wore. And they got absolutely swamped with orders for the T-shirt. It went through the roof for kind of like a small independent. And, of course, people were buying this shirt, putting it on, and then displaying it to the world by taking pictures of it and putting themselves on social media. And the original creator of that mm-hmm. tweet, I think it was a tweet, saw it for the first time and got quite angry about the fact that that tweet had been taken and used without the permission of its creator. What can, what can I do there? Cause you, you said earlier about, um, or you could write to the person. Well, in, in this case, it's quite easy, isn't it? Because the person who yeah. cr- created that quote originally knows who's using it, yeah. but sometimes you don't know who people are on social media. They, they exist in an anonymous form. So how, how do I get hold of someone if they're anonymous? Can I do that on social media? And also just more generally, if I do think that someone is making money out of my mm-hmm. original idea, what do I do then? So how you get in touch with people on social media is generally through the platform itself. So whatever their kind of abuse protocols are, their takedown um, requirements. And that may or may not be successful because, like I said, often a social media platform will... <laughs> try not to be the arbiter between two people who it yeah, can't yeah. determine the rights of. So then you're thinking, you know, if you're really annoyed and it's really quite wide scale, then you'll probably need something like an arch pharmacal order. So you'll go to court, you'll say, this is their identity. I know, need to know who's behind it. And then you pursue them kind of in the traditional sense. Um, in terms of whether you can take action or not. It, so in the US, I wouldn't know because they have their fair use laws which are way broader than anything that we have in the UK or the EU and really for them it's almost like if it's a transformative use it's permitted now that's you know very big simplification but this would generally be considered transformative and so it potentially is permissible over here that would not be the case because over here we have fair dealing which is if you know if the exemption applies it would be fair dealing and it's much more narrow but in this case I don't even think it would be that would apply because in that case you're just taking a quote which is a piece of copyright work it's a literary work and you are reproducing that quote on a t-shirt so you are reproducing the literary work which is an infringement of the copyright plain and simple and and we don't have that fair use kind of transformative dealing over here so it would be an infringement now if it was a kind of historical quote let's say well not let's say that's not use the word historical, something that was still in copyright. So if it was a a quote that was still in copyright and you then parodied that quote, then you're probably fine because you're within the fair deal. You're in the parody exception. Now, fair dealing generally means that you're not denying someone kind of like a commercial avenue that they would otherwise have. But in the sake of a case of a parody, you know, you're not really going to parody yourself. So it's not a commercial avenue that you would have had yourself. So in, in the strict kind of Frank Ocean world, I think you probably in the UK would have a good case. I think finding that person wouldn't be that difficult. And if they were making as many t-shirts and as popular as you were, then it would probably, even if you couldn't find their identity, it would probably be worth either taking an arch pharmacal order. The alternative would be maybe to seek alternative service. So you could do a draft complaint against an unknown defendant. And then there has been cases that have been served via Facebook, like instant messaging, because 
the all of the um i think it was a defamation case and all of the activity was taking place within facebook and they just could not find out the identity of this person and so they just got um alternative service and served via facebook direct messaging so watch out roberts if you nick one of my jokes i'm coming after you <laughs> don't worry lee none of that is appearing on any t-shirt i ever wear <laughs> I can't speak for Barry Trifford. That's a different no, story. Is, that's the danger, isn't it? Yeah, because law unto himself, that lunatic. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's quite an interesting kind of modern issue, actually, that story, because the whoever tweeted that quote gave it, allowed everyone to retweet and use it within the Twitter platform. Mm -hmm. It crossed platform, as it were, mm -hmm. from Twitter to reality. Which yeah. is, that's, that's the strange yeah. thing, isn't it? That's such a, a modern kind of phenomenon. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, so it is trying to kind of figure out, okay, what were the rights? And that one's kind of an easy one because it's a quote, so it's it's kind of copyright. But you do, generally it's not that hard, but, you know, you do need to kind of apply some kind of mental effort to figure out what the right is and then and then what's, how it's being infringed. So what I don't get, I, what's a meme? Lee, what's a meme? I keep seeing memes. What are they? What's you a know, meme? I, I don't know if I really understand it. Isn't it just some, isn't it kind of like an image, a GIF or a GIF? I don't know how you actually say it yeah. or, um, or something like that, that translates something that's happening in the real world into a funny kind of representation of it. And then lots of people start using it. Is that a and meme? It, and it's accompanied by the words, be like, be like that meme. I know. So that's, that's a side story. One, let's do the whole podcast on memes. <laughs> find out what they are. Through the medium of memes would be good. Through the medium of memes. There you go. I'd be interested to see what your your what memes you choose to represent yourselves. Um, <laughs> oh, you've set me a challenge now. That's by, by, by next week I'll have one for Gwilym. Other podcasts be like, and then and then there you go. There you go, <laughs> That's it. That's a meme. That's a meme. So a meme is generally going to be a parody because you're again you're taking some like an image that people know and then you're kind of converting it into a, a topical situation so it's generally going to be a party so it's generally going to be an exception so it's generally going to be fine to use it irrespective of the platform you're using it on because it's a party and so it's permissible so you're grand um you were asking me a very topical but slightly outdated topical question in in the prep lee where you were asking me about article 13 yeah i was going getting... to come on to that you've stolen my funder now i was going sorry, to look really, sorry. i was going to look really informed and ask you about article 13 <laughs> So, well, I'm just saying it now because basically the, the whole outrage around Article 13, and that was Article 13 of the copyright, the Digital Single Market Copyright Directive that was being brought in in the EU, which is now actually Article 17 when it was transposed. But the, the whole outrage around Article 13, 17 is that it was going to kill the meme and Grumpy Cat would be no more. And the, the internet went black, you know, Facebook went black in some countries, like in protest of this. No, uh, none of that happened though, did it? Legislation. No, because it was never going to happen because a meme is always a parody. So a parody is always an exception. So it's always going to be totally fine. And and really it, it was about, you know, people saying that rights holders were going to enforce all of their rights and make everything be taken down. So maybe it was more slightly in the case of, a video so if someone's doing or using like music in the background to a video then there's potentially a bit more argument that gotcha. it can take yeah. down. and the way it's been resolved is there's got to be a kind of a, a, a consultation between the platforms the, the platforms do have more onerous obligations now to take things down and to be cognizant of what is being posted on their on their sites but at the same time, rights holders need to provide them with the information to be able to know whether something is an infringement or not. So this, honestly, still how that's going to be um, implemented across the EU, I really don't know. And there are still discussions going on because I think they, they slightly parked it because they said as part of the directive that they would facilitate discussions between the rights holders and the platform. So it was kind of like, we all know we want something, but we don't quite know what that is. So we're going to continue the fight and we'll get there eventually. But the UK has said it is not going to implement the, the DSM copyright directive. So the UK will potentially at some stage come up with its own solution. But I think it just, 
well, I've heard one commentary saying it was literally just the first piece of law that came out of EU after, you know, we were in the transition period. So whatever yeah. the piece of law was, we were going to say no. We were going to say no, yeah. Exactly. But it happened to be this one. And maybe not a bad one because it is so, although very, very disappointing for all the UK companies that did so much lobbying in relation to it, you know, from both sides, because all of that hard work that they invested has now just kind of gone by the roadside in relation to the UK. I might for Gwilym because he looks like he's about to launch in with something. No, I'm still thinking about memes. Go on, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's 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 stick with images then. So um, I, I often use images online, and I all, I'm always quite careful to go to sites that either tell me that they're free stock photos, free image library, mm -hmm. or I've learned about a little bit about the Creative Commons license, but I wouldn't say I fully understand it. Mm -hmm. So what what can I can and can't I do around photos? Yeah, so photos, so there are image libraries like Getty Images and things. Generally, you need to get a license from them to use them. So they, what they'll do is they'll get licenses for all of the photos that they include in their library. And then you pay them for the use of whatever bits you want. Or there are these ones that are just totally free with, under Creative Commons. I would say, like, there's a lot of people, but another myth. So, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> Okay. Oh, working from home. Apologies, world. <laughs> so the one of the other things that I was saying is kind of like a, a myth that you need to bust is like even this week I got a, a draft contract saying or you know everything we use is in the public domain, so we're fine to use it. Something that is on the internet is not in the public domain. Public domain is a specifically defined thing that means that it is out of copyright. So generally, it's going to take a very long time for something is in the public domain, probably the life of the author plus 70 years. So it's not, you know, most I, likely. I suspect that might be the most misunderstood thing on the internet. Absolutely. It is freely available on the internet. That does not mean it is not in the public domain and it does not have copyright attached to it. So you do need to be careful where you get your photos from. If something is under a Creative Commons license, that means that they are permitting you, they're, they're basically kind of waiving their, their license or their rights in it. They're allowing you to use it but only on the basis that you use it in the same way so that you then can't use it in your material yeah. but prevent someone else from yeah. using it. So it's like this big ecosystem of, of sharing the love and it's great. Just be careful if you're doing that in relation to software though because that can become terrible it's a whole other issue but you know creative commons does not just mean that you can use something for your own commercial gain um you have to make it freely available yourself so um but yes be careful around photos like i said photographers are sensitive to how their material is used and there was a, a kind of a scam going on in in germany it got a bit of press in the ip world where there would be people writing to organizations very large organizations saying you use my photo please admit that you've used my photo and take it down and so the organization just to kind of you know it would be for 200 euro admit it and, and pay me 200 euro and so they would to get it off their back they would go oh, yes we did we're really sorry yeah. um here's your 200 euro and, and we'll take down the link that, that the post from our website but what they don't do is take down the underlying url or all the embedded metadata that went with that web page so there and are still then, breadcrumbs exactly there are breadcrumbs and then the the photographer comes back and says now it's a willful infringement because you have admitted liability and yet you're still doing it. And now I want a million euro from you. So be careful what photos you use. Do use things that are from stock libraries where it says in the terms and conditions, you do not need to pay us and you can use it for whatever reason you want. The other thing is, you know, just because someone is making something available, people often have like two types of licenses. So for example, TED Talks. They say for your personal use, use away, you know, for educational purposes, use away, but for commercial purposes, you need to contact us and you need to get a license. So some companies approach things differently depending on how you're planning on using them. So if you are a company planning on using something online, just check the fine print. Brilliant advice. Brilliant. We've talked a little bit about exceptions, parodies and um, fair dealing and the like. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about is I'm, I'm a teacher by second profession. I'm a plumber by first profession, teacher by second profession. I don't know what I am now. Um, I've not used social media for, for teaching because I'm too old and I stopped teaching too long ago for it to have been involved in my teaching. But I know a lot of teachers that do. They have particularly, it's happened more and more so during the pandemic. They use Facebook to help run 
classes. They bring in kind of YouTube videos mm -hmm. for music and performance and stuff like that. I've always known that in the world of IP, there have been exceptions for use for teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. How does how does that translate into social? Yeah, like I said, it's the same, you know, the same IP rights apply. And so do not fear using these online platforms and, and sharing all the materials that you would normally share with your students in the little, you know, bubble that you are. But similarly, we had an inquiry recently where a client who, who was slightly more of a professional outfit was trying to do something altruistic and wanted to share its materials, but they kind of wanted to just be careful about who could use them so yeah. that it didn't just become a free-for-all. So they wanted to make them available on a private, I think it was a private YouTube channel. I, I honestly can't remember. But the problem was that the YouTube terms and conditions were that if you put something on this, it can be used within YouTube. Yeah. So it was preventing this company that wanted to do something to help teachers to make more facilities available to them because it couldn't risk basically all of its valuable IP just being available for everyone to use for free without any remits around it. So it, it is tricky. I think if you're a teacher, you should progress you know, without any real fear, I think it would be, be, a be very, bold. It be bold. I think it would be a very bizarre position for an organization to take to take a IP infringement claim against a teacher who is trying to teach students during the pandemic. You know, for <laughs> PR reasons, that is probably not like, you know, the number one piece of litigation that you should be starting. But if you are, you know, an educational company, and, and who want or any organization who wants to provide facilities and, and help people during this really tough time, then just be careful what you are putting up there and, and how you're making it available because you might be losing rights in it. And while you might want to do that for now, you might not want to do it forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's lovely advice. And I, I think it obviously makes perfect sense. It, it just worries me. It's, I, have, I, I think I'm sounding a bit cynical and regulatory today. But <laughs> this all works while everyone is being nice to each other, is being fair and isn't abusing and everything else. But to come, to come back to a point I was making earlier, I was thinking about the parallels between presumably the giant social changes that must have happened when the old, when the copyright, sorry, the trademark kind of legislation was being built. What, 100, 150 years ago, I don't actually know, um, when brands became a thing and suddenly, you know, you didn't just get stuff from somebody you knew, you were buying things in shops with brands on and suddenly this whole new realm of protection and care was required. And looking at some of the parallels about some of the things you've talked about. So the idea of kind of creating identities in different places to secure your position, but potentially to stop other people doing it. That's that used to be called trafficking, I think, under the, you know, that's that that's the thing in the trademark law that's been dealt with probably a hundred years ago. Um, the whole point of trademarks was always to provide an indication of origin. Mm -hmm. So you knew you were getting something mm -hmm. safe. And your point about the, the World Health Organization story and people doing that, how do you know these days? I tried to get a visa to go to Cambodia and I went to about six websites before I decided which one was probably actually the legitimate yeah. Cambodian government. The, the whole point about establishing the right in the first place, to, and we have the registration system to do that. There are so many parallels, I think, between that great change and n years ago and what we're facing at the moment, which is kind of growth as complete new platform and medium and I guess what happened last time around as well was that for a while it was a wonderful commercial free-for-all but eventually the free-for-all and the, the freedom that entailed got outweighed by the consumer protection point I still wonder whether we're going to see something like that in this world at the moment there's a lot of fairness and sense but surely abuse is going to come and the regulators are going to have to step in Definitely. And I think there is, you know, I think we're already seeing it, to be honest, like we probably all received text messages saying, oh, we, you seem to have not paid your whatever bill, please follow this link. And the link is absolutely not to your service provider, you know, so it's definitely already happening. And you have great People like the people at PIPCU, which is the police the IP crime unit of the London City Police, who basically their entire focus is online infringement. And so these things are already being looked at. I think it's not still warm and fuzzy. It's already getting quite nitty gritty and, and, and horrible. 
potentially, yes, regulatory will need to step in. I think at the moment, the regulatory issues are dealing more with privacy issues and, and data protection. But definitely, like all the online harms legislation that's coming through at the EU and at the UK, all of you know the, the Digital Services Act that just got announced in, in um, the EU last month or at the end of December, and, and the corollary, the Digital Market Act, which is more on the competition side. I mean, that's already looking at counterfeit goods and, and product liability and, and stuff being sold, but all with an online digital focus. So Absolutely, it's all coming and and the potential for these large organizations to be broken up if they're not seen to be compliant. There's there's a in Australia this week, the news, Facebook going going black in Australia because they're not taking licenses from the, the news corporations, whereas Google will. So, you know, it's definitely happening. There is because there is a tilt in the balance of who is has the power. And that the bigger that tilt becomes, the more interest there is going to be and focus on those organizations. Absolutely. I'm conscious of time. I could talk forever on this. And I know I've still got another couple of questions to squeeze in, Rebecca. And I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I know Gwilym sometimes gets a bit agitated now and is getting ready to, to move on. But I've got a couple I'm more. i every minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely a lie. And we, we we touched on trading earlier on, and uh, this this one's always been fascinating to me. I, would, I was going to say I've got a couple of friends. People who know me know I've got no friends. There are a couple of people I know who trade. One one does kind of pet services stuff, and the, the other is actually a sort of plumbing and heating firm, but has no online presence other than social media. So no no, no website, nothing like that. They have Facebook pages for their businesses. They advertise through Twitter and mm-hmm. Instagram and, and places such as that. So they they take no other online presence other than, other than social. Mm-hmm. That's always felt to be a little bit risky to me. What are their right? I imagine they've got the same rights in terms of trademarks and stuff if they've got a brand name they want to protect. But isn't it a bit risky trading just through social? Yes and yes. They have all the same rights. You know, they can build up their reputation in the same way that anyone can in an offline world. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, when when we're filing trademark cases, you know, trying to prove use, for example, so much of that now is dependent on social media. You know, how many followers do you have? How many likes do you have? What posts have you made in relation to a particular product? You know, how many likes did that have? What was consumer engagement? So, you know, we're already using social media use as evidence of use from a trademark perspective. So there's no reason why someone who is solely online can't have the same rights and build up the same rights. So so that's not an issue. What I would say the slight risk is, is if all of your presence is just on one place, then you run the risk that if something goes wrong, you might be deplatformed. So whether someone tries to block you, it could be you know a competitor that gets annoyed. It could be um, a client who really dislikes your service, and then they set up a rival Facebook page, and you know start bashing you. Uh, people get redir- you know when they Google you that they get redirected to the other Facebook page instead of yourself. So there's definitely a risk. You know, I, I would say everyone should probably have a website as well as a. Facebook Facebook page because there's also that kind of underlying trust issue if they're only available on this one platform and they disappear how will I contact them and it might be that you know lots of people are totally fine with that but but potentially there's just another sense of security if there's and if they if they exist in an ecosystem that is not dependent on someone else like a platform great advice so uh, let me finish with my final question then uh, again a little bit of background to this I in my last role, so before I came to to CEPA, I was involved in the move to regulate further education teaching. There are a couple of hundred thousand teachers in further education, so you've got a big audience out there. And sometimes it got quite horrific on social media. I I, I suffered lots and lots of sort of reputational attacks and so on. And the organisation I worked for suffered the similar kinds of reputational attacks on on brand. So what we did when things went wrong there was rather than engage with people on social, we tried to bring the conversation back to a space we owned. So bring it back to announcements on the website and the like. Uh, We made some horrible mistakes. We closed down a um, a LinkedIn group because it was, it was just too horrible there. Um, The the attacks were too personal. And then we got accused of trying to censor social media and, and the like, what can you do? 
when things go wrong because we are we are in the era now where customers users will tweet first and think later yeah it's really really hard and some of the stuff is just i mean absolutely horrific like you can't i think normal people can't even really imagine some of the stuff that goes on there's one thing that sometimes i find helpful is looking at how many if you can find it out the statistics about how many people are actually viewing these sites because as even though it's incredibly personal and you just want it taken down immediately because it's so awful it might actually be that the only people that are looking at this site are the three people that are on it and you yeah and in which case who cares other than you and i'm not being dismissive it's horrible but really if you bring any more attention to these people then it will a encourage them and b potentially increase their audience so there's this thing called the streisand effect where um barbara streisand's house was captured on i don't know it was google images or you know satellite or whatever and she objected to it but no one had ever looked at this image until she objected and then hundreds of thousands of people looked at it and suddenly everyone knew what her house was like but if she had just been quiet then no one would have known so a lot especially with our big client organizations organizations uh, the very you know the PR team get very head up about things because it's you know horrible but you just have to say is anyone aware that this is happening other than you and if not then maybe the best thing to do is just let it lie they'll go away if it becomes much bigger and it comes to something that you just cannot turn your cheek to then yes you need to engage with the platform you could engage with them you know some people kind of try and reach out and say a oh, you know, I'm really sorry that you're feeling this way. Let's have a conversation about it. You know, and you see that a lot on kind of TripAdvisor, for example, if people are giving one one yeah. star reviews that hotels try and engage and things like that. So that's another way. I mean, really, it is kind of fact dependent on, on how apparent it is um, and whether it's kind of free speech or it's hate, hate speech. And, you know, hate speech is, again, something that's being about, you know, most likely about to be regulated again. So it might be that there are more options available when the online harms legislation comes in. Um, but generally, especially if you're like a bigger brand, I would say just be a very, it, it's not just a legal decision. It's a PR decision. Seeing pl- the inflammatory power of a single comment, isn't it? It's incredible. I, I force myself not to read the comments on the BBC website and stuff like that, because I know I'll get really angry. And then I get worried thinking, gosh, is everyone think that way and of course it's one person because it's on a platform you feel like somehow it's amplified enormously so yeah no good point about perspective there and making sure that just how big that damage is and some brands are quite good aren't they there there are some i follow on twitter and i think it's because they let the people who are working their social have a individual voice and they'll often sign it with their name at the end of a tweet they're actually quite good. They can make this stuff, the seemingly aggressive stuff, appear a little bit funny. Absolutely. Uh, and I quite I mean, like that. My, my husband showed me something on um, Facebook on, on the other night, and it was um, Weetabix saying, have your Weetabix with Heinz baked beans or something. I just signed it, whatever it was, just signed it absolutely horrendous. It's like, forget your toast, use Weetabix instead for your baked beans. And the pile on from so many brands was like, you know, you okay, hun? And like, even, you know, Heinz getting involved, all these different brands just getting involved going, no, your grand thanks, I'll have my mobile. Or it was just absolutely hilarious. But it was this whole ream of hundreds of organizations just having fun with it, you know, and rather than attacking each other and, you know, being nasty, they're raising their awareness um, and, and ultimately you know Weedabix probably trended as a result anyway so yeah. why do they care it was that running wasn't it, it was, i think it was, i'm going to get in trouble now. either oldie or little apologies and uh, um brew dog and there was a kind of a question mark over whether the brew dog beers were being aped by oldie i think it was and then but then brew dog made it into a joke and then oldie made it into a double joke by doing a rip off of a rip off and ended up actually jointly jointly launching a beer and giving the proceeds to charity i mean it's magnificent and with, that, with all due respect to lawyers it was a much better solution than getting the lead the lawyers in on that one it was a absolutely. lovely way of solving it absolutely i i breed i've done quite funny things like that i know they got sued yeah, as well i think because they had elvis juice and then they had i think that was a few years ago and they came up you know they just said we are not going to make this any fun for you so you either engage with us as civilized human beings or we will make your life hell because we have we're punk is is part of our our yeah. you know DNA we're punk IPA we're we're going to punk you if you uh, if you don't engage with us and part of that's brand identity you know just embrace your brand identity and go with it. 
It's a lovely place to leave it. We this, we're on a high, aren't we? So now feels like an entirely good time to wrap up. Uh, unless either of you have got anything else that you want to. Just thanks for having me, and the apologies for my dog. <laughs> no, I think, thank right, you I so you. much for coming on, Rebecca. I've, I've really enjoyed this one. Gr- great to meet you. Great to you. Um, speak to someone so obviously expert in the kind of complex relationship between social and IP. Awesome. Great for the listeners who have now got a bag load of advice they can take and they, they know what to do when things go horribly wrong. So thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. And to you, Barry, I'll see you next week. And <laughs> by all means, bring along some of the little triffids because I'd love to see them. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs>